I'm so excited to talk to you about your novel, Afterland. It was a thriller, and I freaking loved it. Uh, this is our U.S. edition right here. Uh, can you tell us what it's about? It's about a world where 99% of the male population have died. And um, that means that there's a 1% survival rate. And Miles is one of the survivors. He's 12 years old. He's been kept in a government facility and his mom has broken him out. And they're on the run because she has a very awful sister mm -hmm. who actually wants to sell him off to boy traffickers. So it's this epic kind of Cain and Abel chase across America. But there's also, you know, the mother-son relationship. There are a lot of like really interesting people they meet along the way that express all the different kinds of ways of being a woman, which turns out are as e much evil as they are good. It's, it was so good. It was so cinematic and thrilling. And I've already got a copy for a friend. It was so good. Um, so yeah, the novel, it starts off with that dynamic between the two sisters, Cole and Billy. Um, like you said, you know, Billy has fallen in line with boy traffickers and Cole will do anything to protect her son. Um, why did you want to explore the tension of a, I guess, a chase narrative between two sisters? Partly because it had been done before and partly because I spent about a year trying to make the bad guy a man. First mm. of all, it was like Cole's evil ex who happened to be one of the survivors. And then it was her bumbling brother who just didn't think it was a big deal. You know, sperm is so easy to come by, come on. Mm -hmm. um, but it just didn't make sense. And I was going through these contortions trying to make it work. And I realized, you know, it's a world with almost without men. Why am I centering mm -hmm. men at, you know, at the heart of this? And we haven't kind of seen a lot of those kind of narratives between sisters. And Billy is a narcissist. She's relentlessly self-centered and awful and she sees that she's the wounded one. Her sister's being so unreasonable by not letting her sell her nephew's sperm. Come on. Um, and, and there's no, also no good reason for that, which I think is also true. You know, we want, we want our bad people to have been broken in some way to explain why they're like this. And some people are just self-interested and selfish and don't care about others. Um, but yeah, to have that kind of sister dynamic. And of course, this is someone Cole desperately wants to trust mm -hmm. because it's her sister and she's been cut off from everybody else. She's in a foreign country. Her husband has died. She's all alone. And suddenly her sister appears like a miracle. Of course, she's going to want to trust her. For sure. Yeah, Billy was so much fun to read because her, she's so mm -hmm. intense and visceral. It was, it, she's such an interesting character. Um, she was really fun to write because mm -hmm. she's so full of certainty. Whereas Cole is constantly questioning herself. I think Cole is a lot like me and a lot like a lot of us where mm -hmm. we're anxious and we're thinking about what I do wrong and was this the best choice and I'm on the run trying to save my kid. But well, I mean, hopefully not a lot of us are going through that experience, but you know, to mm -hmm. have Billy's absolute certainty was actually quite a relief um, to write. But she is, she is just relentlessly awful. For sure. Like, I love that line. She says, uh, you know, she gets blood over leather seats at some point, And she's like, well, that's why we upgraded the leather seats. And I was like, you yeah. are just certain <laughs> as hell. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so she's a, she ends up being a part of this thriving black market around sperm, uh, which is referred to as white gold. Um, what inspired you to have her join the the sperm bootlegging business, which I thought was well, such a cool all, element of the novel. First of all, I wanted to say that I never thought I'd write so much about sperm in my <laughs> entire life. Mm. Um, <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, so, so Billy's been dodgy for a while or sketchy mm -hmm. for a while, you know, in Cape Town, when she worked in the restaurant industry, there's a lot of gangsterism in, and protection mm -hmm. rackets. And she kind of got involved with that and like some cocaine smuggling on the side. So she's always been a hustler and kind of making it work for herself. Mm -hmm. And she saw this amazing opportunity because her, her boss, um, the, the husband died and the woman's basically taken over the criminal empire. And Billy's mm -hmm. like, Hey, I can get you some of that sweet, sweet sperm uh, mm -hmm. that we can sell on the market. And, and for Billy, it's, you know, she justifies it to herself as a way to make herself rich, mm -hmm. but also now she can like help free her sister and her, you know, and her nephew and get them to this place in the world. And they'll also be rich. So honestly, what's the big deal? Mm -hmm. Even though it's a 12 year old boy, 
And essentially what we're talking about is the rights, we're talking about reproductive rights and the mm-hmm. right to have a say over your own body. For sure. Um, why did you want to explore the targeting of men or boys' reproductive rights? Because it, it was interesting also that people who are trying to sell the sperm think there's a loophole because it's not actually physical contact. Why did you want to explore that? Um, yeah, so because, because we've seen the opposite narrative so many times mm-hmm. and the teenage girl in peril with the human traffickers after her and the dad coming to the rescue. I'm looking at you, Liam Neeson. Um, <laughs> Mel Gibson, thanks. Mel Gibson, you also. know, just <laughs> many. And, and I wanted to kind of flip the narrative on the way we talk about girls mm-hmm. um, and how we sexualize teenage girls and, and we dehumanize them. And Miles in this position is also being dehumanized. Mm -hmm. But bodily autonomy um, Mm -hmm. is really important. And we, the same way we over-sexualize teenage girls, we also force boys into roles where they have to be hyper-masculine and they have to man up and they're not allowed to cry. So it was was really kind of trying to ask some really big questions about gender um, and how we express that. I love that uh, whole narrative in the book it was so so interesting there's a scene pretty early on where miles and his mom before the kind of crackdown of remaining well it's going on the crackdown of remaining boys but it hasn't reached them yet and she tries to take him to the airport um, to go back home to south africa and it's this really interesting scene where you know, they get swarmed by police and the black family behind them puts their hands up and so do they. And so it was this interesting mix of um, the fact that black people are targeted in America mixed with the fact that he's targeted because he's one of the few remaining males left. Um, What inspired you to kind of tie those two themes together? So I aim to be intersectional um, Mm -hmm. in my politics um, and also my writing. But I also have, you know, and I did a lot of research because Miles is black and Cole Mm -hmm. is white. Mm -hmm. Um, And his dad was black. And she's South African, his dad's American. And I spoke to a lot of kind of American or a number of American friends who have biracial kids. Mm -hmm. And I talked to them about their fears. And I talked about, um, my one friend Catherine was talking about taking her then six-year-old to a Black Lives Matter protest. Mm -hmm. And it was actually a scene in the book. I don't think it made the final cuts because it was so much backstory. Um, Where where Catherine took her her six-year-old daughter to a Black Lives Matter protest. And and she wanted to do it because it was important Mm -hmm. and that her daughter understand, but also it was disturbing for her six-year-old to see people doing the die-in mm-hmm. um, and kind of lying down and saying, don't shoot. And, you know, I'm, I can't breathe. And also she was terrified of the police. She grew up in South Africa mm-hmm. um, and she said she saw an apartheid response from police. So as a South African, as someone who grew up in a racist state, I'm hyper aware of this. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is something that's important to me to explore in my work. Um, Sure. And also, the, you know, it also comes back to at one point, Cole expresses a fear about, you know, um, you know, they, they lock kids in cages in America. And that mm-hmm. was happening even before, like, the man apocalypse happened. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. yeah, so I wanted to speak to kind of all those things and why. And that's probably why she thinks South Africa will be a better place. Um, because although we have massive problems of our own, including gender based violence, um, it's, we, and, and we do have violent police as well, but it's not on the same kind of scale mm-hmm. as it is in America. And of course, black people in South Africa are in the majority. For sure. Yeah, it was, it was really cool to see how a thriller could reveal more about racism and police brutality. What do you, are there ways that a thriller can bring attention to that, that you didn't, maybe it's because it's so cinematic that it just helps you zone in on it? I guess. I think, you know, I'm very interested in the texture of society. And that's why the book is also set three years after the manpocalypse. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's still based on our social structures, our political structures. It's still kind of life under the patriarchy. Things haven't magically changed. Mm-hmm. Those are power structures which work, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think to be able to have that as a textual background, to be able to kind of have that detail can hopefully speak to it in some interesting ways. Definitely, you definitely did. That is what I loved about your book also, is just because the men disappear, the oppressive systems didn't just suddenly go away. Um, 
you know, patriarchy, capitalism, racism, um, and that the matriarchy can be just as power hungry and evil as the men can. Um, I know you Absolutely. Said, especially, sorry, especially when yeah. they feel they have more to prove. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. that aspect of it too. Definitely. They have kind of a hunger that they, because they've been oppressed for so long. I know you've been asked this before, um, but what was the process of the world building like? Like, where do you even begin? Do you look at epidemics first or how does that work? Um, so I tried to design a, a plausible virus. Um, it's actually an oncovirus and that was kind of inspired by um, HPV, which is of mm -hmm. course a sexually transmitted virus, which can turn into um, cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. um, so again, that's a little, a little narrative flip. Um, but, but also I, was, I, was, I really spent a lot of time thinking about the world and every single person I ran into over like the years that I spent writing this book, I would plague them with questions. You know, oh. if someone was working in the mining industry, I was like, oh, what, what will happen to coal mining if all the men die tomorrow? Oh. And, you know, I went on a container ship and I harassed the captain and I said, well, what would happen if the men died? How would container shipping and the shipping lanes work? Um, and there were some really interesting answers. Uh, programmers are actually probably not going to be a problem because mm -hmm. there's a huge rise of women in coding, especially in countries like Qatar and Egypt. Mm, wow. um, there's also sh international shipping and even piloting fl flying planes would probably be okay. The problem comes in where you're pulling into harbor um, because there are people who pilot the ships into the harbor. Wow. And those get notoriously like, kind of gung-ho cowboy men, chain smoking, mm -hmm. might be drunk while they're doing it, but they're also the only people who know how to get into the harbor. And that's a skill set that's not easily transferable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, especially if those men are dead, they're not going to be around to teach us and we're going to have to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time kind of thinking about that and kind of, but, but it's not an apocalypse. Like the world still works. It still holds together. We have a shortage of satellite technicians. So maybe GPS is a bit janky. Mm -hmm. um, but, but women are holding it together. And unfortunately also stepping into some of those oppressive roles. It was, yeah, it was, I loved like mo small moments, not small, but you know, where uh, Miles would see like around like a trucks and be expecting to see male truck drivers. And then the woman's there chain smoking and sleeping in her car. <laughs> so cool, uh, not cool, but you know, unexpected. Um, Absolutely. I, and I've had a lot of male readers responding that way. They've been like, wow, you really made me think. I had to keep interrogating myself. Mm -hmm. um, That's yeah. so interesting. I've, yeah, I guess interrogating themselves about what they're used to seeing, the roles that they're used That's to seeing. Funny. It's so yeah. cool. Yeah, you know, there's also the Smurfette syndrome, you know, where you should often like, you know, especially in ch children's media, you've seen a change in it recently. But with my 11-year-old daughter growing up, you know, she, she'd noticed. She's like, why is there only one girl? And why is her personality the girl as mm -hmm. opposed to the clever one or the funny one or the one who's good with like tech? And we've seen a massive change with that, but it is still deeply imprinted. And there's a lot of kind of internal stuff that we've got to get over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's what I loved also about Miles and his and Cole's relationship as mother and son is they have the same humor. They're like on par with each other. You know, there's not this astronomical separation between them which i thought was so cool um and there's also things that aren't fixed like global warming and things yeah. like i mean you kind of just answered that but yeah i guess in thinking about all the things that wouldn't be fixed um why did global warming stand out to you um because i had a friend who'd worked on a documentary about global warming mm -hmm. and he basically assured me that we were all completely fucked that it was too late <laughs> And um, we all even did it. The world population died, it was too late. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of fed in directly. I'd like to hope that's not true. I'd like to think I'm a pragmatic, optimist, humanist. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it's scary, you know, mm -hmm. and it's been scary with the stuff happening around our current real pandemic. Um, For sure. That, you know, we saw a huge dip in global emissions, but it's back up again. And, and, and the fact that we're bungling this such immediate crisis, you know, a crisis that is so immediate and so terrifying and people are dying around us and we're bungling that mm -hmm. and it's so present. I don't see how we're going to like be able, actually able to figure out how to address climate change, which is still kind of this vague thing, which mm -hmm. despite wildfires and, you know, crazy temperature stuff happening and, and hurricanes, 
we still think of something which is not going to affect us in our lifetimes. For sure. Yeah, that's what... Sorry, makes, you're a downer. No, not a downer. I think it's what makes your book so lifelike in reality is because we're only three years after this huge change happened. So nothing would be magically solved and nothing would be magically disappeared either. Um, so yeah, we, we have to work on it. We've, you know, and I think working on stuff is a continuing, continuing process as a society and as individuals. Um, mm -hmm. We have to learn. We have to you know, be better... We gotta try and get out, get our stuff together, and yeah, for sure. And while we're and while the characters are trying to, there's you know a black semen market going on. You know, yeah. there's important stuff going on here. Um, I might have been reading into this question because I was so into your book, uh, but we'll see. So Miles, he's on the edge of puberty, and so he's able mm -hmm. to pass as a girl with the right clothes and makeup. Uh, sometimes and I really like the scenes where you know when they're first on the run and they're seeing other parents in restaurants and they dress their daughters even younger than they are as kind of a nostalgia for what could be the last generation um, were the disguises for him just a logistical decision or were you inspired by you know that kind of psychology of parenthood or even drag I think he makes one drag comment at some point that I was like oh no absolutely you know there's certainly like drag kings and trans men uh in the world and um that's definitely a factor you know the clothes that he wears initially which are like mm -hmm. super girly and a little bit kind of problematic the shirt says mm -hmm. this is how we do and Cole's like was that intentional or did the sequence fall off mm -hmm. um, but they've actually been chosen by Billy you know um so so it was really interesting to kind of play with gender identity um of course I think Miles does think of himself as a boy I don't think he's questioning that himself mm -hmm. but he has to present as a girl um and and that raises some like really interesting questions as well um especially when he meets another character uh, who thinks that she has a lot in common with him for different reasons. Um, but yeah, you know, I was, I was interested in kind of exploring that and, and how we express ourselves. Um, so cool. Yeah. I loved all the, the gender sort of nuance that was going on. Um, so Miles and Cole are visiting America when all this happens and they're from South Africa so what inspired you? Because he's a survivor and he has survivor's guilt every once in a while or not every once in a while, but how did you, uh, what inspired you to explore survivor's guilt? Is it just because logistics of being the last one or one of the last? Uh, yeah, I think there are those logistics. I think also it comes from being, I guess, specifically a white South African, mm -hmm. you know, because I grew up under apartheid and I grew up under this terrible, repressive, racist regime mm -hmm. that had people assassinated, uh, sent into exile. There was a chemical weapons program. You know, it, it was really, really horrifying. Um, and of course, I benefited from that. So I think I carry a lot of that kind of survivor's guilt, white guilt with me. Not in a way like, oh my God, I'm so paralyzed, I can't do anything, but then I'm very aware of mm -hmm. like social injustice. Um, and I really try to live my life in a way that, that speaks to that and addresses those kinds of issues. Um, yeah, but I think, you know, there is a lot of, a, a lot of that happening and, and we especially have a lot of violence against women in this country and that's also mm -hmm. devastating and I feel like there's some survivor's guilt there. But I also wanted to explore the nature of trauma, you know, it's three years after this has happened and we've lost all the men in our lives. And yes, of course that means we can walk alone at night and that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, unless you run into Billy and her kind of thugs that she's hanging out with. Um, but they're also, you know, men that we love and care about. Um, and it's our gay best friends and it's our romantic partners and it's our fathers and our brothers, you know, you know, the way politicians always talk about it when there's been a, murder of a woman mm -hmm. and they're like oh we must remember women are our sisters and our mothers and our daughters <laughs> like yeah yeah absolutely as if we're not people in our own rights but but we've lost a lot of people in their own rights you know we have lost all the men and it's and it's very tragic as well you know it's not this sudden magic utopia um and people are still reeling from that for sure and i love that we get to see miles his full range of emotion you know we, it was so refreshing to have a young man that was so full and like that um i know you've also answered this before 
but why did you want to set the story in America instead of South Africa? And did kind of that like the handling of things like the AIDS crisis in America, did that influence it at all? I wasn't specifically thinking about the AIDS crisis. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had a massive AIDS crisis here of our mm -hmm. own, which was so badly handled by the government. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and was just absolutely devastating. Um, which ironically has made South Africa slightly better adapted to dealing with the pandemic now, yeah. um, although the economic effects are terrible. But I won't dwell too much on what's happening right now. Um, the reason for studying in America is, first of all, that it, it's a wider cultural landscape that a lot mm -hmm. more people can relate to. Um, and of course, that also makes it more commercial, but that's not my primary reason for doing anything. Mm -hmm. But also because I need a call to be alone. Because I thought, okay, well, if I had to go on the run tomorrow, the number of my friends who would help me, who would shelter me, you know, who would hide me, help me get into drag, change my hair, fake passports. Um, right. You know, I, I, I needed to isolate Cole. I needed her to be alone in a foreign country where the rules have changed, which, which is known for taking parents, children away from their parents. Mm -hmm. um, and for her to be so desperately afraid of losing her son and not having anyone to turn to. That also means when Billy shows up, she's, she's desperate. And she needs to trust her. Yeah, I thought, yeah, it's a beautiful combination of, like, you know, this American landscape, but told from an outsider perspective is so, so interesting. Um, it helped me look at different landscapes with a fresh eye, fresh, fresh eye, fresh eyes, yeah. for sure. All the um, eyes. All the eyes, every, the third eye, all of them. Um, <laughs> Were you, in, I know it's not quite an apocalypse story, but were you inspired by any books or films as you were going? And are there any tropes that you thought, okay, I'm gonna avoid, I'm gonna avoid that one? Um, so I think the, the Road by Cormac McCarthy was definitely kind of playing in the back of my head. And especially the ending of that book, which I'm not gonna, mm -hmm. gonna get into spoilers, but I hated. <laughs> and as a parent, I would never have made that decision. Wow. Um, and, <laughs> You know, and I think with the, the, the Church of All Sorrows and the Neon Nuns, there's a little bit of like the Handmaid's Tale, but of course any kind of, you know, end of times time is going to attract its fair share of like cults and mm -hmm. red religious groups. Um, so I definitely had those in the back of my mind in terms of avoiding cliches about apocalypses. I, I don't like the trope of the chosen one. You mm -hmm. know, I love the movie Children of Men. I haven't read the book, but the movie is one of my favorite films. But this idea that the entire fate of the world comes down to one person is inherently not interesting to me. Right. I'd rather set a personal story against the backdrop of like massive world changes or world events. Um, For sure. But not that like, you know, this, this boy is the savior. Although of course, you know, the church they fall in with will definitely make him think that he is. Mm -hmm. And that's very dangerous. It's a very dangerous place for that to be. For sure. Yes, I love that. That she's just trying to get them home. They're not here to save the world. We're, it's a very personal story in this amazing, amazing thriller. Here's the U.S. edition one more time. There it is, Afterland. Thank you so much for coming on. This was so cool. Thank you so much, Danielle. It was really fun talking to you.